Okay, that right there, that's a car stereo. This is out of, I believe, a 2002 Ranger, Ford Ranger. And a customer sent it in to me. It's been here once again way the freak too long. And so there are the uh, tags on the side of it at least. Maybe you can get a number. Who oh, I don't know. Somebody might need something off one of these things. It's been worked on in the past. Audio Craft Electronics in Carlton, Texas. And 8104. Is that 94? I would imagine. 04? I don't know. Well, it can't be 94, obviously, if it's out of a 2002. Uh, there is a work order number and a tech. Some of it's been scratched off. So I have no clue what happened to this. But anyhow, I went ahead and I ordered what I thought was a connector so I could power this up on the bench because the customer did not send the correct connector. And uh, let me try to get you zoomed in down there just a tad. And if you notice, it's got two pins on the upper right row, right and left, that are larger than the rest of the pins. And so I looked at this connector that they sent me and I can't get it to plug in. Well, basically for two reasons. So let's go ahead and I'll lay it down where you can kind of see where it goes. And then this is, right, let's put it back in auto magical focus. So this is the connector as I try to push it in. And yes, it is oriented correctly. Let's go ahead and I'll zoom out just a tad. So it is oriented correctly. And it, it just doesn't even want to go at all. Not to mention that those two pins that are offset from the rest of them are, I don't think the right width to accept those larger width pins out of the radio itself. So I ended up going out to the junkyard, rummaging through, and I found this connector. And as you can see, uh, the pins on those are much wider to accept uh, these two pins right there. I haven't even tried to plug it in. I did label it so I know where everything goes. So let's go ahead and see if this will actually plug in peacefully. Oh, look at that. I mean, it just slides in and locks into place. Perfect. Well, I'm telling you what, this company, Harmony, HA711771, was the connector that I ordered. And it was tough to find one of these that uh, fit the stereo side. You can find them all day long that fit the harness side so you can make your own adapters or whatnot. But I uh, got this from Amazon. It's been probably a month ago since I, it came in. Hopefully I can uh, do a return on it because it just does not fit. So be warned if you're ordering a Harmony Audio HA711771. It may not fit your Ford Ranger car stereo. In fact, the first time I ordered, I messed up and I ordered uh, this Red Wolf connector. Um, I guess it would be an XCFD12-0003. Um, car radio W something CD player receiver new. Uh, I believe this is going to fit absolutely perfectly, but my bad. I ordered the wrong side. <laughs> I ordered the radio side, this side. So that unplugs perfectly. Now the replacement connector I ordered, will it even plug into this? Well, it takes a lot. I can't get those pins to even see it in there, and it's really, really tight fitting. Once again, uh, the pins are wider than I believe the holes are, and I don't want to really punch it out. I mean, I could probably jam it together, but you can see how it it's wider than it should be. Does this one fit? Like a glove? Does it unplug peacefully? Yes, it does. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and send back, once again, the Harmony connector that I got right here. Uh, just poor quality Chineseium crap. And I'll probably just go ahead and send this back because whoopsie doodles, I ordered the wrong part. So yeah, I'll get it boxed up. Actually, really all you have to do is put them in the bag and then uh, hopefully my return has not expired on these things.
and I can go ahead and send these back. Well, I think one was like nine or ten dollars, and the other one was eleven or twelve, something like that. So I thought about keeping them if they would actually work. I would hang on to them, but I don't really have a need for this side. And if this one's not going to work, it does me no good. Uh, like I said, I had to go to the junkyard and pull this one, which I do have the receipt from. So $4.99 plus all the admission, environmental fees, blah, blah, blah. $6.11 is what I ended up paying for this thing. Uh, yeah, sold as is. Now, they did sign it, so if it does not fit, I can bring it back and get a credit. Not a refund, but a credit. And then whoever signed it there, and hopefully that might match with that. But I don't think I'm going to have to return it because... It fits absolutely perfectly. Okay, um, the complaint on this thing. He said that, like, the volume just scrolls continuously. I do believe I have to go back and check the email from probably almost a year ago. Um, I'm sure it's just a rotary encoder. It might have just dirty contacts in it. But um, I got it laid out. All the pins have been identified, so I'm going to apply power to this thing and uh, turn it on and see what it wants to do. Let me get it wired up and we'll be back in one moment. Okay, well I do have 12 volts applied to the unit and as soon as I applied the power, it went through and it checked the six CDs and it showed there were no CDs available. But I can't get this thing to even turn on. If I hit the eject button, it just says no CD. And as you can see, it's been on for four minutes. Then after a few seconds, it times out. I have the power supply set to 13 volts exactly, and it shows that it is drawing approximately 800 milliamps as I press the eject button. But I can't get this thing to turn on. Then as I go to different modes, let's let it time out again. Oh, I thought, there we go, select slot. But why can't, I get the radio to work. Moving to one, load CD1. Okay, so that actually works. But I would think by pressing the AM FM button, I think it just said loading done. I wasn't looking at it when that happened. I would think that by pressing the AM FM button, it would turn on the radio or push on. So is, is that the problem? He mentioned uh, something about the volume just kept going nonstop. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get this thing open, see what it looks like inside. All right, so I got the top and the bottom off and just taking a look at the bottom of this board, it doesn't look too terribly bad. However, I do see something in this neighborhood, maybe a little bit of corrosion, I'm not sure, uh, especially that little green crusty right there, maybe corrosion, I don't know. Um, let's take a look at the other side of this. All the capacitors are way up here, and none of them are down here. There's a couple of inductors right there. And uh, there's one inductor and another inductor right here, I believe. And these are the capacitors up here. Uh, let me uh, enable macro mode. One moment. Okay, macro mode has been enabled, and just above D301, right there, I do, well, here. I do uh, see some uh, junk on that plate through right there. Um, all the rest of them actually look pretty good. Let's go down the line. Uh, maybe that's just normal. Um, it, I don't know. It looks like it's got some crusties in that plate through. It should be a completely open hole like the rest of them are. Well, let's flip it on over and see if it will refocus on it. And we'll move it on over here. There is a surface mount cap. Uh, oh. Maybe that main cap is leaking after all. Because that resistor, I think it's R802, the right side of it, does look a little bit darker. Let me turn on the other light. I had to shut off one light because of reflections. Uh, that definitely looks crusty. No doubt about that. 
And we'll take a look around all of the other capacitors. Maybe a crusty down there, I'm not quite sure. But there's one other thing that I wanted to show you that I noticed on my initial visual inspection. Everything else looks adequate, I guess you could say. I guess it's just dirty. Maybe I should just take it out and blow all the dust out of it and see if that helps. I looked at all the surface mount caps. None of them appear to be leaky. There's a Philips IC. I do have the CD player removed, obviously, or you would not be able to see anything down here whatsoever. And I'm not sure who makes that IC. I believe it's an ST. Yes, it is an ST Electronics. Uh, here's what I wanted to show you. Take a look at those two connectors. That one's pretty much disengaged, at least on the right-hand side. And then this one is slightly disengaged. Now, this is what connects the main board up to the front panel. So how do these things become disengaged? Um, there's a tab right there. Did the tab get bent? And it's actually pushing the circuit board back. There's another tab on this side. Let me zoom out a little bit. Sorry for the defocusing momentarily. So yeah, there is the connector that connects the circuit board, the main board to the front panel. And that would certainly explain a lot of the problems that I'm having with this thing. Uh, well, initially not even able to turn this thing on because it's not really making good connections. So was this in an accident? I don't see any other issues with it. The gap like over here appears to be pretty even with the gap on this side. So why do I have a large gap at that connector that connects the main board to the front panel? Well, I'm going to go ahead and pop off uh, the front panel completely and take a look inside there and see what it looks like. And then we'll kind of try to address this possible corrosion issue. Maybe that one cap right there is leaking. 4,700 at 16 volt. That's probably the main filter cap or stiffening cap for the two audio amplifiers that live right here. Looks like it's probably got more power on the fronts or the rears versus the fronts or the rears with the two individual audio amps. Okay, one moment. Let me get the front panel popped off of this thing. All right, so I got the front panel off. I don't see any obvious defects. I just want to do a continuity check on the power switch, which is these terminals right here. I have it in continuity. And so I'm just pressing down on it and I see two ohms, one ohm. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, 0.7 ohms, that's not a problem at all, 0.4. So what I'm doing is actually just pushing down and it's closing the contacts on the main power switch right there. So not seeing any issues there. I don't see any problems over here. I just don't know why it's not plugged in all the way. I don't really see anything bent or broken. So I think I'll just try to plug it back in and make sure it's actually making a good contact. And we'll move forward from there. One moment. Yeah, not quite so fast. So the uh, control right here goes to the fifth pin on the top. We'll call it the top. And oops, sorry, out of view. So fifth pin on the top, zero ohms. And then the actual power switch button goes to the second pin right there, zero ohms. So if I go from the second to the fifth, when I press it, I see one ohm, zero ohms. So I know continuity is good up to this connector right here. Knowing that bit of information, I can actually plug this back on right here and go to the second and the fifth pin over here and see if I get continuity when the power switch is pressed. One moment. Well, one thing I can tell you for certain is the rotary encoder needs to be serviced. So if I go from the center lead, which is ground, to one of the two output leads, one's going to be like A and not A as I rotate it. It's bouncing all over the place. It shouldn't be doing that. It should be a hard zero and then a hard open. 
Same thing on the other direction or the other half. And that can definitely screw up the microprocessor if it's not getting a good clean signal. So I think what I need to do is try to rotate this around while hitting the power button and see if I can get this thing to turn on. Looking at the contacts right down in here, they actually engage at the very, very tip. So I think they were engaged adequately. So I'm going to put this thing back together, put the CD player in it because it's probably not going to want to operate without the CD player and it might cause a permanent error code that I don't have any way to reset. So let's throw this back together and we'll try to slowly rotate the volume while I'm hitting the power button and see if it decides to power up. One moment. All right, so I have the front panel snap back on and I did give it just a slight bit of encouragement. You can see they are much, much more engaged than they were previously. So I just got to go ahead and mount the CD player back into it, which is a really funky CD player. Um, looks like it was designed by Bose where the laser actually sits over here and it looks like it swings over to read the disc and then swings back. What a little extra bit of monkey motion. Now, let me try to get this thing plugged in without blocking too much of the view. Okay, it is plugged in. It goes in that slot, that connector right there. Then luckily they did leave enough spare cable that it kind of just folds over and gets out of its own way. And then I just got to get the screws. There we go. It goes in that way on the side. And then those two go in just like that. Okay, I'll put the screws in it. We'll fire it up. Okay, CD player is remounted. Let's hit the power button. It should light up and tell us that it's doing something. And it just did a check on all of the disks and everything's good. We'll just try to hit the power button and we still see nothing. Try to rotate it while pressing the power button. And I still get absolutely nothing. Maybe I have to hold it, I don't think so. These were pretty instant on. Yeah, that's, that's obviously not it. I think we're making a good connection down to the bottom of this unit right now. I guess I could go ahead and just do an ohm check on the power button to make sure it's getting through to here. Uh, but geez, I don't have any kind of a diagram on this thing. How am I gonna figure out where it goes into the microprocessor to turn this thing on and off? Well, one moment. Okay, still not working. Power on, the CD should go through its little self-test. And I think it's done. So looking at, uh, I believe it was the second pin over here. There it is. I've got five volts until I press the button, then it goes to zero. So I know that that is actually functioning correctly. So getting five volts over to here, switching as I press the power button and we're not getting any reaction from the main microprocessor as far as I can tell. Uh, I don't know where to go from here. I think I'm gonna go ahead and pull the inductor that lives between, I think it's that terminal and that terminal. Now I did measure voltage on these. So I do have 13.05 volts on that side of that inductor, 13.05 on that side. Now I've only got 3.749 and 3.748. No change when I try to press the power button, like if it were trying to power something on. And then these are the four capacitors right here. 3.7, ground on that side. 12.56, ground on that side. 13.05, ground on that side. And then this is ground on that one. And well, maybe, maybe one is not ground. Let's do ohms. So that side is charging, so that is the, the positive side. And this side should be zero ohms, and yes, it is. 
So next step, I'm gonna pull the inductor off that board and probably unsolder that capacitor right there. I did ESR the capacitor. Let me get the ESR meter out that conveniently just turned off. Power has been removed from the unit at this point. Zero that out and we'll go ahead and check these capacitors together. Hey, 0 0.06, that was the 4700 at 16. 0 0.06, 0 0.14, and 0 0.06, 0 0.05. So all the capacitors test good in circuit at least, that they don't appear to be uh, extremely open or extremely leaky. Uh, yeah, okay, CD player coming out one more time. Let's unsolder some parts and look at the traces and see if maybe something is corroded down there. Okay, solder sucker is warmed up and I'm just gonna pull that one capacitor right there off the board which is gonna be those two, those two terminals right there. See if it'll melt the solder. It's probably pretty thick, double-sided board. Yeah, I'm gonna have to add some fresh solder. Some leaded solder to it. All right, hopefully it will come out now. So I'm gonna to try to give it just a couple gentle rocks back and forth. And minus the hair, it looks perfect. I see no leakage whatsoever. Well, shoot, I thought there was gonna be capacitor leakage on that one for sure. Well, I guess I'll pull that inductor next and we'll take a look underneath and see if there is actual corrosion or not. Okay, so I'm gonna add fresh solder once again to help it melt a little bit easier. I do have the 1.3 millimeter tip installed on the solder sucker at this point. And other than the glue they put down, I don't see any issues with the inductor itself. I wouldn't expect this thing to open at all. But let me get you zoomed in down here and we'll go ahead and pull this glue off the board and take a look at that plate through right there. Okay, there is a close up view of the plate through and I don't like the looks of that in the least, as well as some of these other ones. I think the glue may have been the issue underneath that coil because look at that plate through right there. It looks absolutely terrible. Um, that one, that one, both of those. So I'm wondering how easily this stuff will lift off. Try to get my hand out of the way a little bit there. Okay, well that part lifted off pretty easily. I think these company was, would learn not to use this nasty, nasty glue under these things. Yeah, this is gonna be a mess. Yeah, this is not, this is not good. I'm gonna try to soak it with acetone and scrub it off. One moment. Well, I certainly do not want to pre-celebrate a little bit early, but I think I may see a problem right there. I don't think that's connected anymore. 
And that would explain why I only had two and a half volts on this coil when I should have basically 13. I believe that's probably going to be the main B plus input right there. Now, I don't like the looks of this one connection. Let me try to find a pointing apparatus. I don't like the looks of that one right there. It may actually still be good. I'll have to ohm it out. And it goes up here and it ends up going into the chip. Now, what I'm wondering is possibly one of these is the voltage regulator IC and the other one may be a power amplifier IC. I haven't pulled them apart to check the pinouts yet, but I do definitely have concern on that connection right there. I don't think that was connected at all. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and pull the other coil off the board and give it a good thorough cleaning as well. Actually, a lot of the crud that came off the bottom of this was very, very carboned up, like it had been conducting and got hot. So let's go ahead and pop that coil off the board. One moment. Okay, fresh solder going on, lower melting point, then lead-free solder. Solder sucking coming on in once again. And let's put this back in auto-magical focus. That way you can see it as I lift it up. There you go. I'm going to assume that both of these inductors are the exact same. And I did mark them for directionality. So... That little gap right there goes towards the jack on both of them. And they both appear to be identical inductors. And that one doesn't look too terribly bad, but I'm going to go ahead and strip that crud off the board as I did on the other one. And we'll take a look at the plate throughs underneath that conductive glue. I don't know. It's just like a double-sided adhesive pad, but for some reason these things just don't work out too terribly good. One moment. Okay, second inductor is out and I do have a lot or all of the conductive adhesive removed from the board. I am concerned about that plate through right there, which I should be able to access under the board from there to there and run a jumper if necessary. It does look very green and very crusty. Uh, that one's probably okay. I believe that one's okay. Some of these have been compromised, but I don't think they're gonna be necessary because it's on a back plane that has a lot of different plate throughs. So I think at this point, we just need to go ahead and figure out a way to attach power from this lead, which I think comes over here and goes to the one, well, if I can show this on screen goes to the one big fat power lead on this side, which is probably the incoming uh, DC, the constant or the high volt or high current DC. So I'll have to run a jumper underneath the board to repair that. I probably should have measured voltage on this diode right there, Z1. It's probably a zener just in case your voltage runs away. But uh, give me a couple minutes and let's do some tests. If I find something, I will cut back and let you know. Okay, so I have found that indeed this trace right there that runs from here to here is open. So I'm going to try to bear this a little bit so it'll take some solder and bear that side so it'll take solder as well. Let me show you the other side of the board. So it runs from there over to here. So if I can bear the bottom side of the board and just put a jumper wire on the bottom side from that point to this point, that'll be good. Uh, everything else seems to test adequately with exception of this connection right there. There is no connection to this main power feed coming in right there. So let me see what I can do. And hopefully I can add a very small jumper wire on the bottom of the board. So successfully, I did clean up the pads, as you can see right there. So I've got fresh solder right there and fresh solder right there. I'm just gonna run a jumper wire across those two pads, just a little piece of enameled jumper wire, and I'll try to space it off the board just a little bit, and we'll see how that is going to work out. So off camera, I'm tinning the jumper wire 
just tin the end of it so it'll take solder adequately. And I'm going to stand it up just a little bit. And hopefully this is not out of view, but I'm going to get my cutters and just cut that end off right there. And then I'm going to tin it. Just like that. Now what I want to do is lift up in the center very slightly. And then push it back down. And that looks like it's almost perfectly set. Once I add solder, hopefully it'll just come down to the board. And I do like the looks of that. Uh, let's make sure we're not in manual focus. So as you can see, it is lifted up off the other traces. So hopefully that will be a solid fix on that one connector. Okay, so I have done continuity checks from this side as it runs up to there, and then that side as it runs down, everything is checking perfectly. So the next thing I'm gonna do is remount the inductors, and that one connection, um, it doesn't look the greatest, but it's backed up by this one connection right there, and I did do a continuity check on it, and it is perfectly fine. So let's go ahead and remount the inductors. Then I'll have to solder a jumper wire from that one large pin right there over to that connection on the inductor. And then hopefully this thing will be fixed. Okay, well, I got the wire wrapped around the inductor and soldered. And then it is soldered to the one lone pin on the power connector on the back. Uh, both the capacitor and the inductors have been replaced. There's the inductors, there's the other lead to it, and then these two are the other inductor, and then the capacitor goes right there. So everything has been reinstalled. Let me try to get you into frame here. There is the capacitor that went back in, same polarity, negative on that side. And I did stand these inductors up off the board very slightly so they can move freely. If this does successfully power up, I'll go ahead and put a blob of silicone on each side of them to hold them down. Well, let's pop the CD player back into it and see if we get different results. Okay, everything's back together. Here goes something, maybe nothing. Power has been applied. 1.1 amps. Ooh, look at that. It's tuned to 760 AM at this point. So it does... Oh, look at that. The volume actually works now. Holy moly. Can I turn it off? It does turn off. It does turn on. Do we get AM, FM? FM, yes. Presets. That does work. So we have more presets. Everything is working perfectly. These might be just factory default presets. I'm not sure if this thing remembers where it was. What are they, both 1190? Obviously. Maybe that's a popular station where this customer lives. So the next thing I gotta do is connect speakers to it and see if it makes beautiful music. Okay, I have four speakers connected to this unit. Hopefully nothing shorted back here. Got a bunch of jumper leads on the back side down there. So let's power this thing on and see what happens. Well, I didn't hear a pop. I hear a buzz. Let's try to tune it to a local station somehow. Seek. I'm gonna try to get it on 1290, which is a local station here. And it did not find it. There it is. AM is working. Let's try FM. That's a local FM station. And it is working perfectly. The big question, does the CD actually work? Select slot one. 
moving to one, load CD. So, will this thing load in an awkward position? Well, let me go ahead and find a disc and we will give it a try. Doesn't want that. Load, select slot one. I'm not happy about that. It's probably got a dirty switch. I heard the disc fall out, so that's not good. Well, let's try it on the flat side then. Move this back so you can see it. Load, select slot number one. Oh, look at that. It's spinning the disc. And it says it's actually playing. So can I change the track? Seek. It is actually playing a CD. Unbelievable. This is all copyright free audio. It's working, it sounds great. Well, I think with the little exercise, these contacts in the CD player will come back to life. They probably haven't been used in years. So let's go ahead and try to eject the disc. And we'll go ahead and try to load the disc into slot six. And it is playing. So I think that's going to be a wrap. This thing is actually working. I cannot believe it. Eject. Maybe it's normal that it goes in, comes out, and goes back in. Load. Slot number two. No, it took it first try. Let's see if it loads the disc. And yes. I'm going to call this thing fixed at this point. Everyone, thank you for making it through this probably a very long video. I've got probably three or four hours into this thing. So I still need to pull the CD chassis out of this and put some RTV on those coils to keep them from bouncing around. And I think this is going to be done. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me NorCal715videos at gmail.com. As of right now, if you want to leave me a comment on one of the videos, that's probably the best way to contact me. I'm still trying to get caught up on these freaking emails. It's been so long, long road to recovery, but I'm starting to come back. Everybody, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really, really appreciate it. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everyone, once again, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really do appreciate it. Ford Car Stereo, repaired. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.
Okay, after gluing the coils down, let's go ahead and load a disc into slot one. Took it first try. Those switches just need to be exercised. And it should start playing. And yes. So, just got to put the top and bottom covers back on it, get it boxed up, ready to ship back to my customer. Once again, thank you for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye. Everything works. Balance, fader, treble, bass, everything. Thanks for watching once again. Uh, slowly rotate the power button while I'm hitting the power earth. One moment. Well, I certainly don't want to pre celebrate Let's take that again. One moment. One moment.